This is lecture two, elect 270. We're going to be talking about correlation and convolution. So before we start, just a little bit of feedback. This is feedback from you. So somebody sent me a question. I'm not sure to what extent I should ask in the discussion board. And the answer is, ask anything you like. So rather than sending me emails, use the discussion board. So try to put any question you have, whether it's about the content, whether it's about the assessment, whether it's about the schedule, whether it's about um, Canvas, anything else, use the discussion board. <clears throat> a couple of people have said they can't view the recorded lectures because of a firewall. So where they live, there is a firewall and without a VPN, they're unable to view the recorded lectures <clears throat> or at least the lectures that I put on MS Stream. So I've since fixed that. I've made my lectures available on MS Stream, on Canvas Studio and on YouTube. So on one of those three, you should be able to access it without a VPN. If you still have access issues, let me know. I need to know who's unable to access these uh, platforms so I can uh, I can make arrangements. OK, but until that's made clear to me, I'm going to make everything available on all three platforms, MS Stream, Canvas Studio and YouTube. OK, so where are we? This is the second lecture of a total of 11 lectures. So remember, this is a 15 credit module, but there's only 11 lectures. So most of the learning doesn't happen in the lectures. It happens in the problem classes. It happens as you go through the problem sheets and it happens in the fortnightly assessments that you're going to be studying for. OK, so the 11 lectures cover all the material, but they don't cover all the problems. The problems you're going to be learning through problem solving. So it's problem based learning that happens in the problem sheets, the problem classes and the class tests. So we're still right at the beginning of the journey. Last week we spoke about signal classification and we introduced the idea of elementary functions. Today we're going to go over elementary functions again and introduce two operations, correlation and convolution. Now remember, this is week two and on Monday the 19th there is a home test. Call it a class test, call it a home test, call it a quiz, whatever you call it, there is a timed test at 11 o'clock on Monday the 19th. OK, so you might be watching this after Monday, in which case this is history, but I'm recording it before Monday. So the, the test is at 11 o'clock sharp. I will be online from before 11 o'clock in case anyone has any questions. And I'll be online throughout the test in case anybody wants um, any help with anything. OK, the, the, the test is timed. It's one hour unless you have a support plan in place. You're allowed access to Canvas and the course materials on Canvas and nothing else. OK, but you shouldn't worry. The material I've made available should be more than enough to prepare you. But don't count on having enough time in the test to be able to look at all the problem sheets and the problem the classes and the YouTubes and the practice test. You can't. The practice test won't be available on the day. The practice test is available until Monday and everything else, all the problem sheets, etc. They're helpful, but they're not helpful during a test because you won't have the time. So the idea is to prepare for the test so you can go into the test confident that you can do well. You can refer back to your lecture notes, refer back to a problem sheet if you think it'll help, but don't uh, don't rely on that as a way to get through the test. So last week I gave an overview of ELEC 270. I described how it would be run and why it's important, how it links to all the other modules, why I think it will help you to become a better engineer and a more employable engineer 
And I explained what I would try to do to make, to make it enjoyable and relevant to you. And I explained what the expectations uh, I had of you. We went through some basic definitions. What is a signal? What is a system? We spoke about classifications of signals, you know, continuous versus discrete, analog versus digital, periodic versus non-periodic, energy signal versus power signal. We went through all of that. Then we introduced these elementary functions, the unit step, the unit ramp, and the unit impulse. We solved some problems in problem sheet one, and there was a test on Monday. That was last week. This week, a little bit of recap of uh, the, the last bit, elementary functions. We're going to introduce two really important um, operations, correlation and convolution. Okay, correlation comes in two flavors, two variants, autocorrelation and cross-correlation. But the one that we're really going to use heavily this semester is convolution, the convolution integral or the convolution operation we're going to use almost every week. OK, class test one, that's on Monday the 19th. Problem sheet two, that will be available immediately. That's already available, in fact. So remember, we spoke about elementary functions and we said we use these so that we can represent deterministic signals without having to represent them piecewise, without having to say, for example, x of t between t equals minus infinity and t equals zero equals zero. Between t equals zero and t equals one, it's equal to one. Between t equals one and t equals two, it's equal to such and such. So we would like to be able to express x of t using a single expression. So that's what a deterministic signal is. So we want to be able to represent it using a single um, uh, a symbol expression. So a deterministic signal is one that we can represent mathematically. So to do that, what we want is the functions that will enable that. So we need some kind of functions that enable us to represent a signal such as X of T mathematically. So we introduce these three functions, the unit step, the unit ramp, and the unit impulse. And we said that the unit bit refers to, in the case of the step, it refers to the amplitude. The amplitude is one. The ramp, it refers to the slope, gradient is one. And the impulse, it refers to the area. The area is one. So the unit step, the unit ramp, and unit impulse have an amplitude, a gradient, and an area of one. Now, for these unit, for these elementary functions to be useful, we need to be able to manipulate them in some way. If we're going to represent our deterministic signals using these different um, functions. We need to be able to shift them, that's to translate them, to move them to the left and to the right. So these, this is basic mathematics, basic translation really from, um, from high school, from A level. So you can shift a function to the right by subtracting a constant from the independent variable t. So if I subtract a from the independent variable t, that will shift my unit step to the right. So basically, when t minus a equals zero, that's when t equals a, that's when the step happens. If I want my step to happen at t equals minus a, then I would have to subtract minus a, or I'd say t plus a equals zero, therefore t equals minus a. And that's my minus a. So that's a simple case of translation. Sometimes you want to do more than that. So in this case, it's translated, but it's also reversed. It's flipped. It's inverted. So there's different ways I can represent this, but one way is to say it's reflected. So that minus sign, sorry, that minus sign there, that 
means that your unit step is reflected along the time axis. So it's one for negative time and it's zero for positive time. And then it's shifted to the right by, um, by adding this constant A. And again, you can check this. If you set the argument T minus A equal to zero, then T will be equal to A, i.e. that's the point at which the unit step happens. So it's reflected and translated. So why is the unit step really useful? Because it helps us in situations where we need to integrate. So look at this integration here. What we have is an integral of a product of two functions. X of t can be anything. Let's say X of t um, is this g of t, this sine wave. And we're multiplying it by a unit step. So when you multiply X of t, let's say X of t looked like that. It's just a, a sine wave. When you multiply x of t by a unit step, what you're doing is you're multiplying it by zero for all negative time. So all negative time, you're multiplying it by zero. So for all time less than zero, you're multiplying it by zero. And for all time greater than or equal to zero, you're multiplying it by one. So that has the effect of um, erasing or forcing to zero your signal for negative time. So it's converting X of T into a causal signal, G of T. So X of T was non-causal because it was a sine wave, but it's become a causal signal because it's zero for negative T. So what that has allowed me to do is to replace the lower limit of the integral to zero. So rather than integrate from minus infinity to infinity, we're now integrating from zero to infinity. Why? Because the integral from minus infinity to zero is zero, because you're integrating the product of um, a value which is essentially zero multiplied by something else. So in summary, if you multiply something by a unit step, that allows you to change the lower limit of the integration. Very handy. So here I'm multiplying x of t by a shifted, a translated unit step. This unit step that only starts at t equals 2 pi. So we have a unit step that looks like this. And for anything before t equals 2 pi, it's equal to 0. So when you multiply the two, that allows me to replace this limit with 2 pi, because 2 pi is the first instant in time when my signal is non-zero. And that's really helpful. Now, remember we said last week that the unit ramp is the integral of the unit step. And similarly, the unit step is the um, derivative of the unit ramp. So you can just think of a unit step as being constant, which is the slope of this. And the slope of this is 1, therefore the unit step has an amplitude of 1. And we've said before that t times u of t is another way of representing R of T. And the unit impulse or the Dirac function or the Dirac delta function, I sometimes incorrectly write it as the delta Dirac function. It's basically an impulse function or sometimes called a Dirac impulse function. So you can think of it, you can imagine it as a very, very narrow pulse. So it's very narrow, but very 
high, very large, very tall, very large amplitude. But it has an area of one. So if you were to multiply its height multiplied by its width, you would get an area of one. So that's what that pulse looks like. Now imagine if that pulse became narrower and became um, um, wider, sorry, narrower but taller. So imagine if this became narrower but taller. So that the area remained equal to one. Sorry, I'm struggling with this mouse, but you get what I mean. We have a, a narrower pulse, but a taller pulse, but the area remains one. Now imagine the limit as that becomes really, really narrow and really, really tall. It'll have a width of zero and an amplitude of infinity, but the area remains one. It doesn't make sense, I know. How can it have an amplitude of infinity, but an area of one? But just think of it as a pulse with an area of one that just becomes very, very narrow, and very, very tall. So it's the limit. So the Dirac function has a property. It's called the sifting property, sometimes referred to as the sampling property. It's not shifting, it's the sifting property. The sifting property says that if you take any function, x, and you multiply it by a Dirac function, a shifted Dirac function, then you don't have to carry out the integral because the, the answer is one value, one single value. And that single value is the value of x at t equals tor. So what you do is you say t minus tor equals zero. You solve that, that will give you t equals tor, and you put that value, the solution for t, in there. So it's x of tor, i.e. x of that value that makes this argument zero. What value does T have to make this zero? When is this impulse not zero? When is it infinity? When does the impulse actually happen? It happens at T equals tor. Well, that's the value that we put in there. So this is called the sifting property and it's really helpful. It's as if we're sampling the signal. It's as if X of T, X of T might look something like this. That's x of t, but what we're doing is we're sampling x of t. We're taking one single point. We're taking one single point. We're taking x of t at this point. What's the relevance of this point? Why is this point special? Because this is the point when t equals tau. That's the point when we actually have this uh, Dirac function. OK, so we've thrown away the whole signal and we've taken that one point. So we've sampled the point. So the whole integration we can ignore and we can replace it with that one sample. That's called the sifting property. So we can combine elementary functions together. Remember, this is why we're studying this topic, because we can use it to represent deterministic signals. So let's look at the first signal. We have some kind of rectangular pulse. It's got an amplitude of one and it's got a width of one. How can you represent that using unit uh, impulse? Or sorry, a unit um, step? Well, it looks like it's a shifted unit step. You don't have to think of it as a shifted unit step. You can think of it as two unit steps a unit step up, which is this one, and a unit step down, which is this one. Another way of writing this would be U, and because it's reflected, it will be minus T, 
that's because it's reflected. And because t has to be equal to one for this to be equal to zero, it will be shifted by one second. So u of one minus t, that's also a correct answer, and as is that. So these are two ways of representing the same signal. In the second example, we have something that goes up and then goes down again. So we can represent the increasing bit using a unit ramp. So that's my ramp. Why do I know that the slope is one? Because it reaches an amplitude of one in one second. So one divided by one is my coefficient here. That's my one. So unless I do something at t equals one, this is going to continue to go up and up and up and up forever. So what we need to do is um, bring it down. So we need to subtract something. So what kind of shape would I be subtracting to bring this down? Clearly, I'm subtracting something which is itself increasing. So I'm initially subtracting 0.5, then 1, then 2, then 3, then 4, then 5, then 6. I'm subtracting something that's increasing. So I'm subtracting a ramp. And that ramp starts not at t equals 0, but at t equals 1. So it's subtraction of a ramp at t equals 1, r of t minus 1. But what's actually happening is it's not leveling off. It's, it's not leveling off here. What actually happens is it's going down. So I need to subtract a little bit more. So it's not enough just to subtract this bit. I need to subtract a little bit more. So here you subtract a little bit, here you subtract more. So what do I need to do to indicate something that's again growing? This looks like the same as that. So instead of subtracting one ramp, I'm subtracting two unit ramps. It's as if I'm subtracting a ramp with a gradient of two, but actually I'm subtracting two unit ramps. But if I, if I keep doing that, then I'll eventually be doing this, won't I? So this will continue to negative. So I have to stop it somehow at t equals two. I need to bring it back up. So what, what do I do to prevent this going negative? How do I bring this back up? I need to add something. And that's something that I'm adding again is something that starts off very small. It starts off small and gets bigger. So I'm adding a ramp, but I'm only adding it after t equals two seconds. So that's why I add that there. So a unit ramp, subtract two unit ramps shifted by one second, add another unit ramp shifted by two seconds. That will give you that deterministic signal there. So once you've followed through a few of these examples and through the problem sheets, you should be able to do these without much problem. Again, here we have an example. How are we going to do this? We need to recognize that what we have is a ramp and the ramp starts at t equals zero. So we need to find the slope of this ramp. The slope seems like it's got an amplitude here or it goes up by a volts, assuming it's a voltage, and it takes two seconds. So the slope will be a over two. But something has to happen at t equals two, otherwise this is going to keep increasing. So we need to subtract something, and that something is probably going to be a unit ramp, or at least a ramp with a gradient of a over two, followed by a unit step. So here you have your ramp, minus another ramp, 
minus the unit step. But the unit step needs to have an amplitude of A because that's the um, that, that's how much it's going down by. It's going down by A. So the basic operations that we carry out on the dependent variable. Remember, we have your independent variable T between brackets and you have your dependent variable um, X of T, your signal. So you can either add, multiply or scale. So this is all basic um, high school A level transformations. So assuming that your um, scaling factor A is greater than one, then when you multiply your independent variable T by this constant greater than one, it will cause your function to be um, stretched by a factor of one over A. So in this case, you're multiplying by two, but what you're doing is you're compressing, you're compressing your signal. You, it had a width of two, now it has a width of two divided by two, which is one. So we've compressed it. And in the same way, if you were to sketch y equals t over two, or one half t, you would have the opposite effect. You would be stretching it. Well, you'd be stretching it by a factor of one over one over two which is two, so it become wider, okay? So that's um, multiplication of a constant by the independent variable T. So the independent variable, remember, that's T. Okay, your independent variable is T. But this isn't new to you, 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 you should know all this. Now, this is the bit um, that's really new for this lecture. It's these operations correlation and convolution. And for correlation, I often use this example just to illustrate what we mean by correlation, why, why we use it. So correlation is a, a matching exercise. So it's an integral or it's a summation for discrete signals, but it's a matching exercise. So let's say you had this picture, this picture of a crowd and I gave you a photo of someone and I said, can you find that person in the crowd? How would you do it? You would probably hold the photo up and you would, let's say that's your photo, and then you would move it across the image. And you would keep trying to find a match to see and every time you move the image, you'd have some level of similarity. But what you're trying to find is the maximum similarity. That's where you can say, ah, oh, I found that person. I found that person in the crowd because the similarity is a maximum. Well, correl cross-correlation is something like that. Now, obviously in this module, we'll be looking at one-dimensional signals, but I'm using two, dimension, two dimensions just to illustrate. And a, common um, sort of uh, game, puzzle, pastime is um, where's Wally in this country and in America they, they, they call him Waldo. So that's this character here, this guy with the glasses. And it's, it's, it's a common um, activity for children to try to find this um, character in a large image <clears throat> containing many other people, many similarly dressed people. So it's a sort of matching exercise. And I, I wanted to share this video with you simply just to show you um, it, it's not necessarily a direct um, application of cross correlation, but it could be. It, it, it very well could be. So let's watch this short video. It's the question that's plagued you since your childhood. Where is Waldo? Who is Waldo? What is Waldo? Wait, now I want to know. Who is Waldo? <laughs> we'll never know because we have to find him first <laughs> and then start a meaningful conversation. But there is a new robot powered by AI 
that can find Waldo instantly. It was created by Red Pepper, uh, specifically Matt Reed, a creative technologist there. And to create the AI or to feed the AI rather, he's uh, got 62 Waldo heads <laughs> and 45 full body Waldos from Google image search and then fed the data. The data is Google auto ML vision. Um, and then from there, it was able to successfully locate Waldo uh, with its metal robotic arm, Raspberry Pi controlled U-Arm Swift Pro and a vision camera ki kit to perform facial recognition. But could it work on someone who looks like Waldo? Who, you know, sometimes he's in places with a lot of red and white stripes. That's what I'm saying. Little and beans a lot of with people with glasses head or you know, they do brown hair. To trick you. I think he has a pretty innocuous look. This is kind of the beginning of the end. I'm like spooked now. Well, check out this robot for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Still found him. And it's not even just the pointer finger, it's the whole hand. Sometimes I have the middle finger to find it. And it's <laughs> kind of a creepy way to go about But if you, you want to take all slap. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to take all the fun out of where's Waldo, that's how you do it. Though with robots. I would say it's more fun to use the robot because generally what I'll do is I'll look and I'll be like, this isn't worth my time. I better <laughs> not do the this. Book. And like with most situations, a robot can solve the problem for you. And that's the end. That's of, right. Um, They're humanity. taking your jobs, toddlers. <laughs> they are finding Waldo now. What will you do? Want to um, a T T plus app? Okay, so that that was an illustration of um, the kind of thing that one could do with cross, cross correlation. So just think of that as a potential project. Think, think of um, how easy it would be um, for you to build a project, to build a little robot that could do that. So this robot that you were looking at, that used machine learning and used Google technology. But uh, think of a simple cross correlation um, calculation that you could do in two dimensions to try to locate a face in a crowd or to locate um, Waldo in a um, in an image. So when we talk about cross correlation, we're talking about um, a, an operation that involves two signals, X and Y, P and Q, A and B, two signals, both of which have to be a function of the same variable. Okay, they both have to be functions of time. OK, and the cross correlation is not a function of time. It's a function of a third variable or I'll call it a second variable, uh, uh, Tor. So Tor is not the same as T. So you carry out an integration between X of T and Y, and Y is shifted by this quantity Tor. So that's the equivalent of taking our photo and shifting it across our larger photo by this shift quantity tor. So that is where this comes from. It's how much you shifted one of the images or one of the signals. It could be X, it could be Y, but that's the shift. So what we're trying to do is to find similarity between two signals. We're trying to find the location of that signal or the location of that similarity. So it's useful to find signals within other signals. So I gave you the, the silly example of a photo in a crowd or finding Waldo, but we could use it for one dimensional signals to find 
particular radar signatures, for example, or to, to match, to align uh, signals together. If you have a, a, a bunch of misaligned signals, you can align them using cross-correlation. We're not going to be using cross-correlation a lot this semester, so it's enough simply to know what cross-correlation is, what it's used for, and what the integration actually looks like. Autocorrelation is exactly the same as cross-correlation. It's like cross-correlating a signal X with itself. So instead of having X and Y, you have X and X. So instead of having RXY, you have RXX. So cross-correlation and autocorrelation are exactly the same. Autocorrelation is cross-correlation of a signal with itself. And we use that to find repeating patterns in a signal. Sometimes a signal repeats itself and you can find repetitions of a signal by correlating the signal with itself. So you can see at what time shift do we have this maximum overlap or maximum similarity or maximum product. Remember, we're multiplying the two signals. So one application of autocorrelation is to find frequency content of signals. And you're going to find out next week and the week after exactly how we find the frequency content of signals. And that's using Fourier analysis. And Fourier analysis, Fourier series, and Fourier transforms, that's how we actually analyze our signals and find frequency content. But autocorrelation is also a, um, a simple, uh, computationally simple way of um, estimating frequency content. Convolution, it's slightly less easy to imagine. There's, it's less easy to visualize what we mean by a convolution. Now, when we convolve two signals uh, in time, so the symbol we're going to use for convolution is this. This is not multiplication. This asterisk this star, this represents convolution, not multiplication. So try not to use the star ever to mean multiplication, because it doesn't. It only means multiplication when you're using a computer. But in mathematics, the star generally represents convolution. So um, convolution is a function of time, and the two signals are a function of time. So when we integrate, this time we're not integrating over time, we're integrating over some other variable. Let's call it tau. So x of tau and y of tau. But y is reflected. Remember when we reflected the unit step? So here we're reflecting y. So we have two signals, x and y. x is as it is, but y is reflected and it's also shifted. This T is your shift because remember our variable is tau. So this is the shift. And that isn't very clear, but um, I'm trying to write shift. So T is our shift. And this will give you something which we can call, for example, Z of T, because T is our shift variable. So our convolution is a function of time. So we reverse Y of T, that's the, the minus sign here, this is the reversal, and we slide it. Sliding is the equivalent of shifting. And then we multiply, so that's the multiplication there, and we use the asterisk symbol. OK, so this is a really important integral. We're going to learn how to use it, but then we're going to stop using it after we find ways to avoid using it, using the Fourier transform. But for the next few weeks, we're going to be using it quite heavily. OK, I'm going to try to illustrate what the convolution actually is using a few, uh, a few animations. So this is an animation that I copied from Wikipedia. And um, 
Again, what we're trying to do is convolve two signals, X and Y, okay? What do they look like? In this case, X is a boxcar function or a little um, square wave, and X is the same. So X and Y are both the same. One is red and one is blue. What we've done is we've taken Y, taken the red one, and we've reversed it. We flipped it. You can't see that because obviously it's symmetric, but um, here it's F and G. So uh, G is the red one. G is the one in uh, red, and that's been uh, reversed. And then we said we're going to slide it, going to shift it. So that's the T. That's my slide variable. So that's this axis here. So as it slides from left to right, look carefully what's happening. The overlap is zero, then suddenly the overlap is the, the, the shaded bit, the yellow bit. That's the product of the two. So the yellow area, that's the area under the product of the blue wave and the red wave. So it's zero until they overlap. That's the maximum overlap. Less, 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 zero overlap. So that area is the line that's being drawn in black. So this, this line in black that I'm tracing over, this is the convolution of X and Y, or in this case, F and G. Okay, so this is one example, and I have a number of animations I can share with you. Um, this is one I found on YouTube, and there's a number of interactive simulations that you can look at um, that I hope you'll find um, useful. You can, you can use your own signals, and you can shift them left and right, and you can interact with them and see how, how the... Um, the area or the, the convolution is formed by the area of the overlap. So look, as the dotted signal overlaps the red signal, the area of the overlap increases. But now, because the red signal is wider than the dotted signal, the area isn't increasing anymore. So it carries on, constant, until there is less overlap and then it begins to decrease. <clears throat> so this is just to help you visualize a convolution, but we'll never be carrying out a convolution this way. When we carry out the convolution, it's always going to be mathematical. This is just to visualize what a convolution integral actually is. So, this is the first example and the only example in this lecture. Find the convolution of a sine wave with a rectangular pulse. So we have our sine wave and you have this rectangular pulse, okay? The rectangular pulse is given in the question. It has a width of one, so that's my rectangular pulse. And the question is find the convolution. So first we start with the convolution integral. This is the definition, it's the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x of tau multiplied by y of t minus tau d tau. Remember, it's always d tau, never dt. It's always another variable other than t. So x is as it is. We don't change that at all. The only thing we change is the variable. Instead of t, we use tau. Now, Look carefully what's happening with uh, y. What's happening with y? So y of t minus tau, we have to replace um, uh, t here with t minus tau. So here t becomes t minus tau. And t here becomes t minus tau. And the minus one is minus one here. So all I've done is I've rewritten 
y of t, and I've used what's given in the question, but every t is replaced with t minus tau, because that's the definition. So take a second to absorb that. It might look, it might look to you that the integral is now much harder. It's become quite a, uh, a difficult uh, integration. But in fact, that's not the case. And remember what we said about the unit step. Remember, um, we said that the unit step actually helps us because when we multiply by a unit step, it helps us to replace the limits of the integration. So if you just, just remember, what does the u of t minus tau look like? If we use our horizontal axis as tau, then u of t minus tau looks like a unit step that's reversed and it happens at tau equals t because you, but basically you take that and you make it equal to zero to find the point at which it actually happens so that's that minus u of t minus tau minus one what's that u of t minus tau minus one is also a unit step um, but how does that look? That will look like that. At t minus one, that's when the unit step happens and it's also reversed. So it's the yellow pulse minus the blue pulse. That'll give us the red pulse there. So that means that I can replace the limits of my integration. Instead of integrating from minus infinity to infinity, I can now integrate from, my, from t minus 1 to t. So that's, that's how I got away with that. So instead of integrating from minus infinity to infinity, I can simply integrate from these two limits. Where did I get these two limits? Well, they're the two values that make this zero and make that zero. That's the short way of doing it. Make set this zero, set that equal to zero. And because they make a shape like that, you can just change the limits of the integration. So the integral of sine is cosine, put the limits in and you get that. So cosine t minus one minus cosine t, that is the convolution of a sine with a rectangular pulse. OK, so that's the kind of integration we're going to be dealing with. OK, so I did tell you that it gets quite mathematical quite quickly. Um, and that will probably reach its peak at week four and then the mathematical content should uh, reduce and you should find it becomes much easier after week four. So I've included a number of um, useful little animations if you're interested in visualizing how convolution integrals work. None of these are mathematical, they're all just nice little visualizations, interactive ones. Um, the first one in particular uh, is quite useful and it, that's the one that I've included the QR code here. I've included the QR code simply because if you're watching uh, this as a uh, as a YouTube, then you won't be able to click on it. So you can use this uh, this link. I'm, I'm not sophisticated enough to be able to embed links within my videos, but hopefully um, that QR code should work. OK, so that's today's lecture. We looked at elementary functions in a little bit more detail. We looked at basic operations like multiplication and scaling and reflection. And we looked at convolution and correlation, autocorrelation and cross-correlation. And we uh, tried one example. There are plenty more examples all in the problem sheet. OK, so um, if you're watching this before 11 o'clock on Monday, then remember there's a test your first class test is 11 o'clock on Monday. If you've already had the test, then your next 
um, uh, thing to focus on is your problem sheet. There will be a problem class on the following Monday, but there'll be a problem sheet. You need to look at that as soon as you can. OK, just a reminder of where we are. We are now in um, the second week. Well, I hope you're watching this in the second week, but um, if you are, this is where we are. So we've had our introduction. It's a class test on Monday. Next week, there's going to be a problem class, question and answer. The week after that, class test, etc. So this is the uh, schedule. This, the schedule I will stick to um, religiously, and unless something happens, I am going to stick to the schedule. So make sure you're aware of all the dates for the tests. OK, and on the Monday following the 19th, so the Monday in week three, there'll be a problem class. It will be a live synchronous problem class. Try to come to that class. I, 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 I will try to make it as helpful and as useful as possible. So finally, where are we? We just finished our second lecture and we're on our way to our third lecture where we're going to talk about Fourier series. Now this is this part is where it gets really, um, really fun. OK, so um, this is the um, it's the hard bit, but also the, uh, the really useful bit of this module. So we just finished our second lecture. We're going to start talking about Fourier series, Fourier transform. Fourier transform is so important, we're actually going to spend two lectures talking about. We're going to spend a lecture, the fourth lecture, talk, talking about Fourier transform, and then the fifth lecture talking about the properties of the Fourier transform. OK. So that's um, that concludes uh, our second lecture, and I look forward to seeing you at our next live session. <laughs>